Hey everyone, it's Guilherme and welcome to the last part of our first 3D game using Godot 3.1 series. In this video, we are going to create our end game menu and connect everything up so we have a finished game loop. Let's start off by creating our end game menu and keep in mind that this menu is only going to show when the game ends. So it's going to start off hidden and we are then going to show it to the player when he finishes the game. With our game node selected, let's add a child to it and this time it's going to be of type control. And control nodes are all the nodes that have to do with UI. You can also see that they are green, as we had with spatial nodes that were red and had to do with the 3D part of our game. The control nodes are green and have to do with our UI. So I'm going to add a new control node and I'm going to rename it to final menu. You may also notice that the engine has taken us from the 3D view to the 2D view. And that is because this is the correct view that you have to use when you are dealing with control nodes. If we take a look at our viewport, you notice that we have a blue line here and this indicates the size of our game. By looking at this rectangle and then looking at our final menu, you can see that the menu is at the moment really small. We can fix that by going to the layout on the toolbar and selecting the option full rect. This is going to extend the rect of our control node and anchor it to all four corners of our game. We can see that by pressing H and each of these green dots is an anchor that the control node is going to use to position itself when the game gets resized. With our control node configured, we can add a new child to it and this time it's going to be of type center container. And this container is going to hold all of the other control nodes that we're going to have in our final menu and it's going to float them to the center of our game. This way we have a nice menu that has everything centered and we don't have to manually place things, which is something that is prone to error. Once again, as we did with our final menu, we're also going to click on our layout and select the option full rect. Now with our center container selected, we're going to add yet another child to it, which is going to be a VBox container. A VBox container in simple words serves us as a column. And again, we're not going to go into much detail as how they work. There is a video already on that here in the channel. And if you're interested, you can go ahead and watch it. But for now, we're just going to treat this VBox container as a column. And also because of that, we can already rename this. Instead of calling it VBox container, we're going to call it column. Inside of our column, we're going to need three things. The first one is a title that's going to tell the player that he has succeeded. The second one is going to be another message, but this message is going to tell the player how much time it took him to complete the maze. And then we'll need another container that is going to hold two buttons, one for the player to try again and the other for the player to exit the game. To display text on the screen, we're going to use a label node so we can already add it to our column by searching for label and pressing enter. You can see that our label is here in the middle of our screen. That is because we are using a center container and everything is centered as expected. If we take a look at the inspector, we have a text property and here we are going to type success. And as of now, our text is really small and that is because we're using the default font that comes with the default theme inside of Godot. We're going to change this font and this is the time that if you haven't used our starting project, you're gonna have to go to the web and search a font that you want to use inside of the game. But if you are using that project, you're going to find this font inside of interface in the fonts folder. Here you'll see that we have a Montserrat extra bold font, but we cannot yet use it because this is not the type that the label expects. To use this font, we're going to have to go to the inspector with our label selected. And by the end, you're going to find custom fonts. Here we can check this check mark. And now we have to create a new font by clicking here and choosing new dynamic font. You're going to see that our text is going to disappear inside of our viewport, but that is okay because we haven't configured our dynamic font yet. So let's click on it. Under settings, we can set its size to 48. And under the font, we can just drag and drop our Montserrat extra bold.ttf on top of it. And now you can see that we have the success message showing correctly. Now let's rename this label to something like title. And we're going to add another label to our column. This time, we're going to call it time because this label is going to be responsible to showing how much time it took us to complete the maze. And because we're using a VBox container, you can see that our timer has been placed under our title label. On the text, we can type some placeholders just so we can work with it because later on we're going to replace this text using code. But for now, let's say that your time was one minute and 25 seconds. Once again, we want to change the font. So we're going to go to the custom fonts, select the font, create a new dynamic font. Under settings, instead of 48, we're going to type 32 because we want this to be smaller. And under the font, it's going to be the same one. You can just drag and drop it. Now you can see that we created a problem here. Our success is not anymore in the middle of our viewport. 
fact, it actually is. If we select it, you'll see that the rect around it is in the middle. But what happened is that our text is not aligned to be in the middle. So even though our control node is in the middle of the screen, the text inside of that control node is not. To fix it, we're gonna go to the top of the inspector and here under align, we can select instead of left, center. Now our success message is right in the middle of its rect. Now back to our time label. Remember that we said that we want to create two new buttons, one for the player to try again and the other for the player to quit our game? Well, those buttons are also going to use the same font that we are using inside of our timer. So it wouldn't be great for us to keep recreating this font every time that we want to use it. And it would be a smart idea to just save it so we can reuse it later on. We can do so by going to the font, clicking on the arrow and then clicking on save. It's going to open this menu where we can go to the interface instead of fonts. And here we have to give a name to our font. You can name it whatever you want, but it's a smart idea to name it something that you are going to remember later on what this font is and what is its size. In my case, it's a Montserrat extra bold and the size is 32 pixels. So I can click on save. And now when we create our buttons, we're going to be able to reuse this font instead of having to create it all over again. Now for the buttons, we don't want them to be one on top of the other. We actually want them to be one on the side of the other. And to achieve this, we're going to use yet another control node, which is a horizontal box container. So we can click on our column and we're going to add a new child to it, which is going to be called hbox container. And this time we're going to name it row. This control node is the exact opposite of our column because instead of ordering nodes in a vertical manner, it's going to order them in a horizontal manner. Now with our row selected, we can add a new child to it, which is going to be a button. And we can rename this button to try again. Under the text, as you probably have already guessed, it's going to be try again. And as we had before with our labels, it's also using the default font of our theme. So we're going to use our newly created monster hat of 32 pixels instead of its constant font. As you can see, our text is going out of the button, but you don't have to worry about it. This is going to get fixed once we play the game. This is just a bug that hasn't been fixed yet. And now we have to do the same, but for our exit button. Instead of creating a new button, what I'm going to do is duplicate this node by clicking with the right mouse button on top of it and clicking on duplicate. And I'm going to rename this to exit and under the text, I'm going to type exit. Now I'm going to save our game and I'm going to close this scene and open it again just so we have that bug fixed. And now as you can see, the text of the buttons are inside of them. The buttons are still a little bit off as they are aligned to the left. So on each button, we're going to select them and go all the way to the bottom until we find size flags. And here on the horizontal, we're going to check expand and we're going to do the same for the exit button. There you go. Now they're taking almost the same space each one and our menu is already looking great. We can save our scene and also let's not forget to save our final menu as a separate scene. So we're going to save branch as scene instead of interface with a default name of final menu. If we decide to play our game now, you'll see that our menu is appearing to us even though the game hasn't been finished. To hide the menu in our game scene, we are going to click on this little eye icon here and now it's going to go away and if we play the game again, you'll notice that the menu is not appearing anymore. Now, before adding functionality to our menu, I'm going to open the scene once again and I'd like to change the background color and an easy way to do so is by changing the default clear color of our game. To do so, let's go to the project settings of our game and under rendering in the environment, you can change the default clear color to something that is appealing to you. In my case, I'm going to choose a dark blue color. I'm going to click out of the menu and click on close. Now our menu is looking better and it's not going to affect our game because the only 2D part that we have is the menu so we can safely change the default clear color without worrying about breaking or making things look weird. As of now, our buttons are not doing anything and to make them work, we're going to need a script in our final menu. So let's add this. We can leave it with the default settings and click on create. We are not going to need the ready function so we can delete this, save our script and go back to the 2D view. And now we're going to have to use signals to react when the player clicks on one of the buttons. And signals are used all the way through Godot in, in several different aspects of the engine and they are emitted when something happens, in this case when we press the button. And then what we can do with these signals is make other nodes connect to them and react accordingly. The node itself that is emitting the signal does not have to know what they are going to do with that signal, he's just emitting them and whoever wants to know when that happens connects to that signal. 
and do whatever he wants to do when that signal occurs. In this case, when we press the try again button, we want to reload our game, and when we press the exit, we want to quit our game. To connect said signals, we have to select our node, in this case, the try again button. And instead of using the inspector tab, we're gonna go to the node tab. And here you can see that we have lots and lots of signals. The one that we are interested in right now is the press signal. And to connect it to our final menu, we're going to double click on it, select the node that we want to connect to, in this case, it's the final menu, and click on connect. A function has already been created to us. And this function is going to be called whenever the signal pressed has been emitted on our try again button. We're gonna leave this as is right now. And we're going to connect the pressed signal of our exit button as well to our final menu. Whenever we press the exit button, we want to reach out to our tree. So we're going to call get tree and call the function quit. This is going to make our game to quit. But on our try again function, what we want to do is make our game restart. This has to be done by our game node. And because we cannot directly access that node, we're going to have to use signals to communicate with it. And to do so, we're going to create our own custom signal that we're going to connect to our game script. So on top of our script, we're going to declare a new signal. It's going to be called retry it. And whenever the try again button is pressed, we're going to emit the signal. And in this case, it's going to be retry it. And now we have connected both the signals of our try again and exit button to our final menu script. We can test these buttons by running this scene instead of running the game scene itself. And to do so, instead of using the F5 key or clicking on the play button, we're going to click here on the play scene button or press the F6 key. This is going to run the scene that we're currently working on. And if we press the exit button, we can see that our game is going to exit, which tells us that everything is working correctly. Now, if you remember, we want our final menu to display the time that it took the player to complete the maze. This means that we're gonna have to access this menu using the game scene, using the game node, and tell him how much time it took the player to finish the game. To do so, we're going to create a new function. It's going to be called initialize. And here we are going to receive as a parameter the total play time in milliseconds. It's going to be a float. And this function is going to be of type void. Inside of the function, as we're receiving this value in milliseconds, we have to calculate how many minutes and seconds it took the player and then apply this to our time label. So let's declare a new variable called minutes. It's going to be of type string. And to calculate the minutes, we're going to divide our total playtime by 60 seconds. And this is going to return to us how many minutes it took the player to finish the game. You can see that the engine is throwing an error and that is because we're assigning a float to a string. And to fix it, we are going to first convert this float to an int because we don't want decimal points. And then we're going to convert this int into a string. As for the seconds, it's also going to be a string, but this time we're going to have to use a function called fmod, which is going to return to us the modulo of the total play time divided by 60. And once again, we're getting a float here. So we want to convert it first to an integer and then into a string. Now we have the minutes and the seconds, and we have to format a string to display on our label. So let's create the string and call it time text. And here we are going to say that your total time was minutes and seconds. And here we are going to format this string to replace each of these percentage s characters with both the minutes and seconds respectively. To do so, we type the percentage symbol and each element of the following array is going to replace each occurrence of the percentage s character that we have on our string. This is going to return to us a string that is going to say total time column, how many minutes we calculated here, and then how many seconds we calculated. We now have to access our time label, and I just realized that I named it incorrectly. It should be called time and not timer. I'm going to fix that. Go back to our script, and in the script, we're going to need a reference to this time label. We are lucky because every parent has access to its children, and to make our life easier, we're going to start this reference inside of a variable. First, we have to say already, because we are accessing a child of ours and by the time we're trying to access it, it might not be yet added to our game tree. The already keyword makes sure that we are accessing something that has already been added to our tree. After that, we just declare the variable normally. And to access our children, we have to use the dollar sign. And here you can see that Godot is already giving us options for us to choose from. In this case, it's going to be the time. And now we have a reference to our time node on our time variable. 
Inside the initialize function, we can set the time text to be equal to the time text that we just created. And we can delete the past keyword. And with this, our final menu script is done. Now that we have completed our final menu, we're gonna go back to our level one scene and connect the signal from our go area to our level one. As you may have already guessed, for this we're gonna need a script attached to our level one node. So let's select it and add a new script to it. And we can leave the default settings and click on create. Here, we're also going to need a custom signal, which is going to be called level completed. We can delete the ready function. And now we're going to select our go scene and under the node, we're going to look for the body enter signal and we're going to connect this signal to our level one. This signal gets emitted by our area whenever a physics body touches its collision shape. This means that when our player touches the area and remember, he is a kinematic body, this function is going to be called. Inside of this function, we're going to check if the body is a player. And in the case that this is true, we're going to emit the signal that we just created, which is level completed. This is all we need for our level script. And now we have to hook everything up inside of our game scene. To do so, let's go to that scene and attach a new script to it by selecting the game node and clicking on this icon. And we can again leave the default settings here we're going to need two references, one for our final menu and other for our player. And as we did before, we're gonna have to use the onReady keyword and then get a reference to our final menu and another reference to our player. We're then going to need a variable to store the current playtime of our player. It's going to be initialized with a value of zero. And we are going to declare another function that is pretty similar to the physics process, but instead of being in sync with the physics engine, this function is called on every frame of our game. And inside of the process, we're going to increase the value of playtime by the value of delta on every frame. With this, we're going to be able to know how many milliseconds it took the player to finish the game when he touches the goal. Now, we are first going to connect the custom signal that we just created on our level one by selecting it and going to the node tab. And now you can see that we have this level completed signal that was created on our level one script. We can double click it and connect to our game script. And when we completed the level, we are going to store our total playtime on a new variable. And it's going to be equal to our playtime. We're then going to remove our player from the game tree because we don't want the player to keep playing when he's finished the game. To do so, we have to access our player and call the function Q3. And finally, we're going to access our final menu and initialize it by passing to it the value of total playtime. And the last piece of the puzzle is connecting our final menu signal, which is the retry that we created on our final menu script to our game script. And whenever this function gets called, we are going to access the tree and call reload current scene. This is going to restart our game by reloading the current scene, which in this case is the game scene. And now before testing our game, I'm gonna go back to our final menu script. Some of you might have spotted this error, but I forgot to show our menu. And if you remember, this menu is going to be hidden and we want to show it when it gets initialized. And to do so, we have to call the function show instead of the initialize. And now we are ready and we can test our game. I just found the goal and now if I touch it with the player, you see that we are greeted with the message of success. It shows our total time and we can either exit the game or try again. Congratulations, you just finished your first 3D game using Godot 3.1. With this project, we were able to see several aspects of the engine and learn a lot ranging from things like gameplay to UI. You can always add more elements to the game if you want to, for instance, more levels, a scoring system when the player ends based on how much time it took him to finish the maze, some traps, and so on and so forth. I hope that you learned a lot and if you have any questions, feel free to leave them on the comment section and I'll see you in the next one.